Hello there, Pirate fans, and welcome to the semester finale of Hall Talk. Basketball at the Hall is in full swing as both the men and women's teams are coming off home victories. Men's basketball earned a victory over University of New Hampshire, earning both the program's 1,500th victory as well as head coach Willard's 200th career victory on Tuesday. This comes before they travel over to Madison Square Garden, take on one of the Blue Blood programs in the University of Kentucky this Saturday. On the other side of the court, the women's team continues a hot 7-1 start to the season with a win over St. Peter's University behind a 33-point performance of Nicole Jimenez. Our panel and I have you covered with all the details on Pirate Basketball. This is Hall Talk. Hello and welcome back to Hall Talk. I'm now joined by my panel, Robert Tui and Robert Ruskowski. Got the two Bobs with me. So, guys, let's get uh, talking into some basketball. How are we doing today? Pleasure to be here. Could not agree more. Just dandy. All righty. Well, let's jump right into it. We are going to first start with the men's basketball team. They currently sit at 5-3 and three following a Louisville loss. That was 70-65. to 65. And then a nice win over the University of New Hampshire uh, just this past Tuesday. So let's look first into that Louisville loss. Uh, Miles Powell, 23 points, 9 for 11 from the charity stripe, but only 2 for 12 from behind the arc. I mean, Bob, that's pretty significant. Yeah, in one word, this loss was disheartening. And when your lead scorer is absolutely dried up from beyond the arc, it puts the team in a compromised position instantly. You take that and you add it on to the fact that they were pretty much without Quincy McKnight, their top playmaker, because he was in foul trouble for huge amounts of the game. The Pirates really didn't stand a chance. And it's a shame because they looked very, very compelling early on in that game. Commanded the tempo of play, great interior defense. The shooting as a whole was good and they were distributing the ball nicely. Then you fast forward a couple minutes, Quincy McKnight's out because he has two fouls. All of a sudden, Louisville's able to crawl their way back into it and then lead at halftime. So, in my opinion, I didn't think Quincy McKnight was going to be the difference maker in that game. And yet, when you take him out of the equation, for whatever reason, Louisville's able to capitalize on more chances. The Pirates' passing as a whole and setup of plays looked very sloppy, and it just gave Louisville a chance to win that I don't think they would have had otherwise. Even without Powell shooting as well as he could have from three, I still think that not having Quincy McKnight in the game as much as he could have been was the biggest difference maker. I agree. I mean, that's been a trend that we've been seeing since their first road trip out to Nebraska. Both him and Tareen Thompson both struggle with fouls. And, I mean, the tempo as well is a huge factor there. Um, this, this Louisville game was very different from their prior home game against St. Louis, where they seemed to control the, the scoring at times, but St. Louis seemed to be in control at most of the points. So in this Louisville game, they had, they had the control for most of the first half, and then come halftime, they're only down by, they're down by a point. They don't even have the lead. So, Rob, one of the major points that I want to focus on with this Seton Hall team is their percentage from three. It's 16.7%. You don't win that many games with 16.7% from the three, especially with one of the best noted shooting guards in the Big East in Miles Powell. So, I mean, you were there with me at the Louisville game. What were your takeaways? Um, really, I mean, in general, it was just a really disheartening loss, like Bob said. Really just almost embarrassing. We were on Fox, you know, national television. You really try to, you know, um, um, prove a statement win and really just left a bad taste in your mouth. I'm sure we're going to look back on that come tournament time and think maybe that was the one that might be able to get us in if we're a bubble team. But overall, I think we were a young team. We don't have the experience to really close it out. Might have been out coached with Chris Mack. I mean, he was on Xavier, so you might have uh, known a secret or two. But like you were saying, three-point, I mean, you can't win a game with 17%. You were saying, even on the season, we're not even shooting 300. It's, we're 297. Our opponents, though, is, are 350. So there, uh, uh, there's a discrepancy just in that alone, you can tell by the stats. But um, like we were saying before, the point guards as well. I mean, Anthony Nelson and Quincy and I combined just two, uh, two for ten from the floor. I mean, with your point guard play like that and zero assists from uh, Quincy McKnight in 18 minutes with four personal fouls, you know, it's, it's not going to be a good win. I really think this uh, loss highlighted some of the um, weaknesses of Seton Hall, and, I mean, hopefully we can improve on that going throughout the season. Well, they definitely did improve as they then bounced <laughs> back with a win on Tuesday Much against needed. the University of New Hampshire. Absolutely. Uh, from the viewpoint of Kevin Willard, and from the viewpoint of the team as a whole, as well as Seton Hall as a fan base, 
I believe this win was needed. Uh, I, just as a viewpoint, it seems to be that this New Hampshire placement in the schedule was well done, especially in between Louisville, who is a very well-known team and a very good team at that, and then you take on the behemoth of your schedule, uh, non-conference, in Kentucky. You put in this nice game in between. Hopefully you can get a bounce back. That's how I saw it. I mean, let's look at this new uh, University of New Hampshire game. Quincy McKnight, as you said, didn't, you didn't, he didn't seem like that big of, a, of an importance in the Louisville game, but then he comes out for University of New Hampshire, 18 points, 6 for 8 from the free throw line, 5 fouls drawn. It seems to be that he might have found his place. I mean, Bob, what's your, what's your thought on Quincy in this game? It was like watching a different player. Uh, he, he went from essentially causing the Pirates' demise with his sloppy play against Louisville to being the driving factor in a win. This is pretty much the first time all season where we've seen a player not named Miles Powell lead in scoring, lead on the floor, and essentially drive all of their efforts into pushing a team to victory. Say what you will about the University of New Hampshire, they're not good. Um, they did not have the strongest schedule. Um, and what, they're two and seven right now. Two and now. seven now, yeah. Um, this was a no-brainer of a win, but at the same time, a much, much needed confidence booster for a Pirate team that just got completely dismantled by Louisville. At the same time, um, they didn't beat the spread. <laughs> but just the same, I liked what I saw. Um, and I thought it was a good team game. It's a cliched phrase, but I think that the scoring distribution and on top of that, a really strong interior defense effort combined to give the Pirates a nice boost. Well, I definitely agree. I'm glad that you bring up point distribution because there were four players of, of the uh, starters that had double-digit points. Actually, no, excuse me, all that's five. all five starters. All five. Thank yep. you very much. Yeah. It was all five uh, with Quincy McKnight leading with 18, Sandro and Miles Kale with 14 apiece. Uh, Mike Enzi with 11, and Miles Powell had the least of them all. Just snuck in there with 10. Just snuck in there with 10. I do agree. So, overall, the other main thing we have to take away is Tareen Thompson did not suit up for this game. We actually found out later on after the game that it was due to an ankle injury. Um, so, he should be back for Kentucky. Probably going to need his wingspan and his height there. Um, but we are going to quickly move on to that game. We're taking a look at Kentucky, currently ranked ninth in the nation, sitting at 7-1 and one with that one loss coming to a very good very young Duke University. They lost 118 to 84 in that game. Um, so, guys, I'm just going to go out and say it. What does Shu need to do to win? It's going to be tough. Um, to be very honest, I think it will be next to impossible for the Pirates to eke out a win against the Wildcats. With that being said, Miles Powell needs to play the game of this year. Uh, there cannot be any inconsistency from three. There cannot be foul trouble early on for any of their key players. Their big men need to be on point in the paint because if those three factors do not come into play, Lu uh, not Louisville, Kentucky can pick them apart from every possible angle. So uh, a lot of stuff has to go right, and frankly, I don't know if it's going to happen. Rob, just a quick take. Um, I, I think uh, we need to win the game both on the rebounds and on defensive end. I mean, Kentucky scoring uh, 84 points a game. They're rebounding 41. I mean, that's better than us in both categories. So if there's any way, possible way we win this game. Right now, ESPN's giving them a 72% chance to win. So it's, so you're all, saying it's a little tough. A chance. You're saying there's a chance. <laughs> I mean, besides that, though, I, I think defense and rebounds. All right. Well, nevertheless, it should be an interesting game from both standpoints. Rob and myself will be there for Pirate TV. But... We are going to take a quick break, and then I will be sitting down with James Justice of the Setonian for our second edition of the Setonian Sports Corner. So stick around for that, and we will be right back. Hello, and welcome back to Hall Talk. I'm now sat down with assistant sports editor of the Setonian, James. So, James, thank you very much for coming on. Thanks for having me, man. So I, uh, I loved your article in the Setonian covering uh, Nicole Jimenez and following her 33-point performance against St. Peter's University. So, James, one of the cooler things that I actually read in your, in your piece was about the, uh, you know, Jimenez coming out of, out of high school in Miami and the, her offers into college. So what did you find from that piece? Yeah, it was interesting. Obviously, she only had uh, two JUCO schools uh, that offered her and then one startup school, uh, Florida Southwestern. Um, it was just really interesting to... Uh, learn about that. Uh, obviously, the big factor there was her height. Uh, mm -hmm. She's five five foot two. Um, there's not a lot of players in women's college basketball who um, succeed maybe with that stature. Um, I asked her about it. I asked her. I pretty much, you know, does it show the coaches um, who the scouts that didn't offer you back in high school? Do, do these types of performances um, show them, you know, that they were wrong? She didn't really want to address it. I mean, I think that just speaks to her character. I mean, she's. 
um, somebody that's very grounded. And I mean, I think it's something that we say all the time. It's overblown a little bit. You know, athletes are very down to earth, but Nicole really truly is um, down to earth. And I think that's what's kind of allowed her um, to get to this point. She stayed really patient um, two, two years at Broward Community College and she's coming to Seton Hall and her potential is really, really high this year. Absolutely. I mean, I would totally agree, especially watching her play last year. She was, you know, definitely an impact player, but, you know, this year she's among one of the top scorers for Seton Hall. And you actually went into that with her about, you know, this team is a very high-powered offense, especially from behind the arc. Yeah. So you actually got to sit down and talk with her about, you know, how she feels and what she's actually shooting this year from behind the arc. So what did you get from her? Yeah, well, I told her what I found w when I was researching, which is pretty much that last year in 597 minutes, she had, I think, 97 threes attempted. And this year in about 258, she had over 75 or around 75. Um, so the team, obviously, it's been documented. The offense is different this year. They're, they're shooting a lot more threes. They want to score more points. They want to play a high-paced style. Um, Coach Brazella has said that most teams in women's college basketball, when they score 90 points, they win. Yeah. So that's what they're going for. And Nicole Jimenez, she said that she feels more comfortable. Um, this is more suited to her style. And obviously, you have a natural transition when you come into a new program. But it was also difficult for her last year. She mentioned in the article that there was more on-ball screens. This year, it's more off-ball screens. So she's, she's more comfortable. And she, she says she has the green light now, um, where she maybe felt last year that she didn't quite have that, that ability or that push from the coaches to shoot when she had the opportunity. So it's, it's a bit of a change for her uh, in the mentality, and it's definitely showed on the court as well. Well, I mean, it's very evident. I mean, it, even from the last three games, they're, they're high-powered offense. But, you know, just before we wrap up things here, a huge game coming up on Saturday. Did she have anything to say about their game coming up with UConn? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. She, uh, she mentioned UConn, and, and I told her how, you know, DePaul – Obviously, the Big East tournament champion last year. This is a team that lost by 36 yeah. to UConn. So this is a, obviously a difficult task for them. I also asked her about, you know, the, basically what her goals were for this season, and she's very she stays in the present. So she's going to focus on this UConn game. She says she wants to take it uh, one game at a time, and she says she wants to treat UConn like any other game. Um, but just moving forward, she, she talks about staying in the present moment. She didn't think about um, breaking any records coming into this season. That wasn't on her mind. Um, it was just something that had ended up happening, and uh, she's going to go into that UConn game, and she's going to try to treat it like any other game, as difficult as that is, um, and we'll see. I mean, it's a, it's, this is a 7-1 Pirates team. This UConn game, uh, they just want to show up and, and, and play a respectable game, and, I, and if, they're, if they can manage to do that on the road in a tough environment, that'll, that'll speak really well to, to what this team can do moving forward. I agree. Well, James, thank you so much for coming on. It really was a pleasure. Absolutely, man. Again, you can find James's article on the very back of the Setonia in the sports section. But overall, thank you very much, and we're going to send it back to Hall Talk. And we welcome you back. We thank James again for joining us. But, guys, we are now going to switch over to the other side of the court, and we're going to talk about women's basketball. So, just for all you uh, viewers out there, just to recap, women's basketball currently sits at 7-1. and one. They're uh, currently on a three-game winning streak. Um, and in that three-game winning streak, just some fun statistics, they have scored at least 90 points in all three of those victories, and they have outscored their last three opponents by 99 points. <laughs> That's a lot of points. So we're going to focus on a big storyline from the Seton Hall women's team win against St. Peter's University, mm -hmm. and that is Nicole Jimenez. What a game. Incredible performance game. by uh, the senior. She outdid, I think, everyone else on her team tenfold. <laughs> By far. She scored 33 points. She was 9 for 13 from three-point range, and she had nine steals. The nine three-pointers is a school record. The 33 points is tied for second in program history, mm -hmm. and the nine steals is also tied for second in most steals in the game, one, point, one steal away from the record. So Closest person to that was uh, Victoria Cardasi with 12 points, and she was 4 for 10 from the 3, taking all of her shots from 3-point range. I mean, guys, what do we have to say about this crazy win? Nicole had a pretty good game. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> you should see me on the street, you know, with a uh, She was game. plus 34. That's Are insane. you kidding me? When you have players like Jimenez going plus 34, Katie Healy went plus 43. And she didn't score That's a point. incredible. <laughs> and she didn't score a point. This was a huge team win, though. And yes, granted, a lot of the scoring load was on Jimenez's back, but we saw very consistent performances as well from Shadeen Samuels, from Victoria Cardesi. I mean, 
this is as nicely clicking as we've seen the team because, in my opinion, this forecasts a lot of good potential. When you can alleviate some of the scoring burden from Shadeen Samuels and you can have a reliable second leading scorer and also a deep three threat in the form of Nicole Jimenez, that is a very promising sign. And granted, their conference schedule is going to be pretty difficult. Big East women's basketball is no joke. With that being said, I, I seriously do think that it puts the Pirates at a much higher chance of finishing in the top five in the conference if they can get consistency. But that's a different story, though, because as we saw last season, Jimenez was not the most consistent big scorer. She had a handful of big games, but for the most part, a lot of dry spells. I mean, I would agree. I think the other main thing we have to point out is there was a lack of Inya Butina for this game. Yeah. yeah. Another I, one I mean, of the I think all season scorers. it's been... Uh, Inu Butina, she actually suffered a concussion. Mm. She was out for this game. Uh, Kayla Hilaire took in and uh, went in for her prior, and she had a career high of 18 points. This, this women's team, when one player doesn't step up, another one comes out of nowhere. I mean, in the early season, you had Victoria Cardesi, who is an ace shooter from behind the arc. After that, you have Shadeen Samuels, who's getting 20-plus points. She was averaging close to 19 points a game. And then you have Kayla Hilaire, who comes in for Inu Butina when she gets injured, gets a career high, and now you have another career high in Nicole Jimenez, who nearly doubled what Shadeen Samuels is averaging on the season. So, I mean, as of right now, this 7-1 and one women's basketball team is looking very, very good. And we were talking before the show, Rob, they were picked to be 8th yeah, in the I Big th East I think that's an understatement. from preseason <laughs> poll. And I would love to see what those pollers would say now, seeing that they're 7-1, and one, averaging a little over 80 points a game. So, just like the men on Saturday, the women have one of, if not the biggest game on Saturday, in the face of UConn at Hartford, Connecticut. UConn is the number one team in the country. They were ranked second uh, this past Sunday, but they just beat the prior number one team in Notre Dame. They won that game by 18 points. It's a blowout, <laughs> not even close. Another other uh, focus that you should have is the fact that this UConn team also beat St. John's by 10 points. St. John's is no joke of a team. I mean, just as much as the men's team is facing a big dog in, uh, on Saturday, I think this women's team is pretty, uh, facing a very big Husky. It's a big day for seeing all basketball. Yeah, 100%. And I think an element of UConn people don't talk about, take the high-powered offense out of the picture, that's a big team. Yeah. None of their starters are under five foot eleven. <laughs> are you kidding me? They're huge. Seton Hall, I mean, you've got starters on that court who are five three, five, five four. Two. You're not scoring oh, any points in the paint, of potentially. Course. That's very, very dangerous. So the three ball has to be there a hundred percent for the hall. But then you look at the starting roster for uh, UConn. Just stats-wise, you've got players averaging uh, 18, 19 points per game. Uh, Nafisa Collier is averaging almost 19 points per game and 11 rebounds. For Seton Hall, you've got Shadeen Samuels averaging 17, and then I think the next highest is Nicole Jimenez with 12, and then just a trickle down in the single digits from there. They have four players averaging triple digits, or I'm sorry, double digits. <laughs> That'd be something Almost if they were four triple monsters digits. monsters over here. It's just, it's <laughs> incredible the way that they are able to distribute the ball and get scoring from pretty much every one of their, score, their starters. Um, I don't think Seton Hall's winning that game, but they'll put up a fight. I think they'll put up a fight. I mean, this is also a Seton Hall team that traveled out to UCLA, gave them a good fight, Seton Hall also beat Princeton, who they struggled with last year. So overall, it should be an exciting game. I'm very excited to see how this team does. I'm excited to see how the bigs for Seton Hall does, especially Kimmy Evans, Selena Faloxi, um, especially Shadeen Samuels as well. But that's going to wrap us up for women's basketball. So guys, I'm just going to then head to final thoughts where we can then finish up our, uh, our uh, semester finale of Hall Talk. Mm -hmm. So I just want to take a look at since non-conference schedule is wrapping up, it should be over uh, before New Year's comes, a little after Christmas. Let's take a look at conference previews for both teams. Men's team, just I want to get a uh, preview or an estimate of what you guys think Seton Hall will be finishing in the Big East and potential tournament time. What tournament they make it in and where they will be. My hopes are not the highest. Um, I think Seton Hall is going to, fi I, I would say finishing 500 for the Pirates in conference play would That's be fair. a big accomplishment. Yeah. Uh, I just think the strength of their conference schedule is overwhelming for a team that has not looked the best again, in very manageable and winnable games. With that being said, looking at the Big East Conference as a whole, I still think you have uh, Villanova, St. John's, and Marquette as your top three, and I see Seton Hall falling somewhere in the bottom three. Right now, they have the worst record, actually, in the conference, fun fact. Yeah. I don't think they'll finish with the worst record. I no. still think 
there's a lot of room for Creighton and DePaul to fall, but, but still. I think that Seton Hall is not going to have the strongest finish. There will be a lot of tight games, I think, but ultimately not a lot of big wins. So do you have a potential location as to which tournament we might be seeing a Seton Hall team in, if they even get to one? No. Honestly, no. I, I really – either, a lot, either a lot can go very right and they'll finish in the middle of the pack, in which case, I mean, they could easily push for the Big East tournament. They Maybe NIT. Outside of that, though, I, I don't think they're going to the big dance again, though, unfortunately. I, th I think last year was the last we'll see of them in, in, the, um, in March Madness for a while. Rob, what about you? Well, uh, on a little bit lighter note, I mean, I think the Big East is <laughs> wide open this year. I mean, they could fall anywhere. I'm going to say from 8th to 5th. I don't think they're going to get that high just yet. They really haven't proved themselves, but I'm going to put them at 7th right now until they prove something to me. I mean, their last two games are against Marquette, Villanova at home, but, I mean, those are your top two teams almost um, unanimously. Um, I think they can get the NIT. I think they're going to be a bubble team. I, I have high hopes for them. But looking back to the Louisville game, you know that uh, that could be one where one goes in, one goes out, and I, I just think that they're just going to miss it. Maybe uh, NIT, but they, but they could give a good run the Big East tournament. You never know if they're um, you know especially if they get St. John's. We've had some luck against them in the past, but that's where I think they're going to fall. As of right now, I think that the Big East is a very competitive conference. I think that we are going to have a lot of exciting games. I mean, we, we talk about Creighton being a bottom of the barrel, but they just put Gonzaga up for a run uh, just over the past weekend. Past yeah. 10 minutes, last DePaul 10 minutes. is being very surprising. Um, and Villanova has two big non-conference losses. Who would have thought? Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. I mean, one of them is to the now-ranked Furman. So yeah. I think for all the Seton Hall fans out there, for everybody here that is interested in Seton Hall basketball, it should be an exciting season. Um, just very quickly, where do you guys see women's basketball falling in the Big East? They look very compelling, <laughs> honestly. On a broader note. Yeah, I, I think they could finish top four, top okay. five. I, I like I, it. I do. I, I'm optimistic. What about you, Rob? I'll put them right at four. I mean, they could go anywhere from three to maybe even seven, depending on how um, it plays out. But I'm going to put them at four for now, top five as well. I think I think high thanks for them. Well, I think we're all going to come to the same conclusion. I also see the Seton Hall women's basketball team finishing at fourth in the Big East mm -hmm. if they can beat St. John's at least once. Ooh, okay. I think they have to beat St. John's at least there. once. Hopefully at home, that'll help them out a lot. But uh, that's going to do it here at Hall, at, uh, Hall Talk here. Uh, that is our final show for the semester. So my name is Chris Famularo. Uh, gladly alongside me is Bob Tui and Rob Ruskowski. We will see you soon. We are still going to do some coverage for Rutgers over the break. But enjoy your break. Uh, happy holidays. And thank you very much for joining us this semester.